Book of Common Prayer. I think we left off after talking about the uh, anamnesis, the remembering, which on page 63, uh, 363, we celebrate the memorial of our redemptional Father in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. And I reminded, uh, reminded you that anamnesis, and, or the, the remembering, is more than just remembering, it's participating in bringing these uh, past acts into the present uh, through our remembering. And then comes what is called the epiclesis, which is a Greek word for invocation. We are invoking the Holy Spirit now upon these gifts. Uh, in prayer A, sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. Now, from the fourth century onwards, prayers in the Eastern rites that would be the Greek, like think Greek Orthodox. An epiclesis of the Spirit was said upon the gifts and the people. The oldest manuscript of what is called the Liturgy of St. Basil, the core elements of that rite are believed to date to the fourth century. There's a petition that says, through the benevolence of your goodness, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, placed here, and sanctify them to be the holy of holies. Now, can anyone think what would be the significance of declaring the bread and wine to be the holy of holies? The Holy of Holies sanctuary space in the temple is no longer that, but now it's these items that have been transferred. Right, and what was the significance of the Holy of Holies? What made it holy? That's where God lived. That's where God dwelled. So rather than in the temple, God is dwelling, if you will, in the bread and wine. In most of the Eastern rites, uh, the epiclesis was a prayer that had language that it might be made or shown to be the body and blood of Christ. Now the significance of that is that is consecratory language. And in the Middle Ages, there was a, a, a sort of obsession developed about when in the Eucharistic prayer, did the bread and wine become the body and blood? So I'll come back to that in a moment. So in many liturgies, the flow of the Eucharistic prayer, uh, starting with the anamnesis, was the, the anamnesis, then the oblation, which is uh, the offering of ourselves in thanksgiving, and an acclamation of we praise you and we bless you, and then the epiclesis. And as the words, of, if you remember, it's been, a, it's been a while, the Roman church treated the words of institution, which is uh, on the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and said, this is my body. Those are the words of institution. In the Roman church, the words of institution were considered to be the moment of consecration, the moment when the bread and wine became the body and blood. But in the Eastern Rite, it was the epiclesis, was the moment. Uh, a, a bit of trivia, perhaps, but important, I think, to the prayer book is a variation on this in which the epiclesis is one of word and spirit. Uh, in Rite 1, in particular, uh, bless, or I can't remember the exact language, maybe, uh, O merciful Father, hear us, and with thy word and Holy Spirit, bless and sanctify these gifts. 
The Roman rite, that's the Western rite, had no explicit epiclesis, saying, they're praying simply that God might bless this offering, that it may be unto us the body and blood of your dearly beloved Son. And that would explain why, in the Roman uh, rites, the words of institution were considered the moment of consecration. I dare say that had they had an epiclesis, they might have rethought that and thought maybe the epiclesis was the moment of consecration since the words are so explicit. Make or made or shown to be the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Cranmer retained uh, <clears throat> this clause of uh, word and Holy Spirit before the institution. In the, fi in the 1549 book, he prefaced it with this invocation, Hear us, O merciful Father, we beseech thee, and with thy Holy Spirit and word, vouchsafe to bless and sanctify these gifts, uh, these thy gifts of creatures and creatures of bread and wine, and thereby he combined the traditions of the East and the West, the word and uh, the Holy Spirit. So the language of the consecration type language in the 1979 Book of Common Prayer in prayer A, B, C, and D is this. Prayer A, to be for your people. In prayer B, that they may be the sacrament of. In prayer C, sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be. And prayer D, showing them to be. All right, now having said all of that, I will remind you that classic Anglican theology is not concerned with the when. We're not concerned with when the body and blood become uh, the body and blood, or the bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We take a, and again I say, I have to emphasize that it's the classic Anglican tradition because the, the high church traditions probably would disagree with me. They, they might very well be concerned with the when of consecration. Now, following the epiclesis are what are called supplications. In prayer A, on page C 363, the Supplications include the sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament, so that, you know, it, to serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. In other words, the supplications here are prayers for ourselves, for the church. Uh, the prayers differ uh, somewhat in the way they word it. Uh, going back to the apostolic tradition of Apollotus, the, the supplication was that the, those present may be gathered into one and that their faith be confirmed. Uh, a prayer for the unity of the church had also been part of the supplication from very early on. Uh, another liturgy of the fourth century prayed for the church, for all those who needed help, and for those who had fallen asleep. In the Reformation, the Continental Reformers removed all the supplications from the Eucharistic prayers as in a reaction to indulgences and in masses for the dead. They just, just took out all that, all that language. But in the 1549 Book of Common Prayer, Cramner included the supplications for the acceptance of our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, our offering of ourselves, our offering of our bounden duty and service, and third, petitions for forgiveness and worthy reception for grace that we may be made one body with Christ. I already told you that prayer A in 1979 includes the unity, constancy, and peace. In prayer B, the supplications go like this, that we may be united with Christ in his sacrifice, that all things may be put in subjection under your Christ, and that we may enter with all the saints the uh, everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Prayer C uh, asks that our eyes may be open to see the, hand, uh, the God's hand at work in the world about us. 
that we may come to the sacrament with right intentions, that we may be made one body and worthy to serve him in the world in Christ's name. And in prayer D, we pray for the unity, the faith, and the peace of the church, that we may find our inheritance with all the saints. And that brings us to the concluding, the final doxology, the lifting up of the elements uh, in prayer A. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Just a reminder, I'm going through all these ancient liturgies to, to help you see the connection between what we do and what we've done uh, in history. The apostolic tradition of Apollotus, the Eucharistic prayer concluded with this, through your child Jesus Christ, through whom be glory and honor to you with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and under the ages of ages. And as time went on, as things evolved, as prayers became more uniform, a Trinitarian doxology, which could still vary from right to right, uh, tended to be included in all of the prayers. Cranmer brought in the Roman doxology into the 1549 Book of Common Prayer. It went like this, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Now, the asterisk here is that the Roman rite actually said by whom and with whom and in whom. But Cranmer only put in by whom and with whom. The in whom was restored in 1979. It took that long to restore it in prayer two of right one, but not prayer one of right one. And in prayers A, B, and D is the language of uh, by him and with him and in him would be the right two language in prayer A. And the whole thing concludes with the uh, word amen in all caps. It's variously called the people's amen, the great amen. Because uh, we should be yelling. Well, uh, I don't know that you should. I don't know that you should yell it, but you certainly should not be shy about saying it. And you may not have ever noticed. I never say it because it's your amen. Ah. Oh, that leads me to a question. I saw um, an article uh, from a Catholic friend saying that. In the Catholic tradition, all of us who grew up repeating what the priest or saying with the priest under our breath, they're saying that we're not supposed to do that at all. What is the Anglican tradition on us joining in, you know, even if we're just kind of going, you know, by home and with home and in home and, you know, mumbling under our breath because we're letting Right, 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 right. But following along. Well, uh, and Carolyn can chime in here. I'm not familiar with a particular Anglican tradition of saying it under our breath with the priest. I am aware that some people <clears throat> have been taught to do that. <clears throat> I'm not aware, excuse me, of any theological reason not to. Um, I can't think of one. I, I mean, basically that would just said that's what the priest is supposed to do. I mean, it, it, you know, from, from the, the, again, the classic Anglican uh, view of what's going on here is that we are priests together, uh, and in particular, since the 1979 Book of Common Prayer, the, the, that, uh, our current prayer book has tried to recapture that sense of we as participating in the consecration together. And that's one of the primary reasons why we are standing at the altar the way we are, that there's a freestanding altar and the priest is behind and facing everyone because, because we are in this together. We, are, we pray this together. 
Now, whether that takes the form of saying the words with the priest under your breath, or whether, as some people do, it's simply <clears throat> keeping our, your hands out like this, as the priest does, you are praying with him or her. That's okay. another thing that, that I would really imagine was the whole Lawrence position. Those in the congregation shouldn't do it. It's reserved for the priest. I'm more... No. <laughs> no. 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 As a matter of fact, the orange position is merely an indication that we are praying. Right. Which means, if you're praying, yes. guess what? Right. It's, it was usurped, I think, by, <clears throat> by default. It was usurped by the clergy. Okay. But we can blame the Middle Ages for this, because back then, of course, not only was the priest doing this, but he was the only one saying the prayer. I mean, he wasn't even saying it so people could hear. The argument on Lawrence was that now instead of being up to God, now it's out laterally to the people in the church, not up to God. Uh, that a, that is a... difference without a distinction, or whatever way that saying goes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I would go even further to say that that is superfluous uh, meaning that's put up on something that it never meant. Okay. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're like this or whether you're like this. It's the orange position. Okay. And this is the way people prayed. People. people in the early church yeah. in, in the early, and, and and in Judaism in Judaism right and if you watch Ben and, and me when we're at the altar we're, we don't do this our hands tend to be spread this way yeah so um, no it's a charismatic movement it kind of went like this you know yeah, it's, it it sort of, kind of it went into that <laughs> the, 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 the wave <laughs> Uh, and I was in the charismatic movement, so I'm not just making fun of it. I'm, I'm, I've been there. So, all right. So the people's amen. In the second century, now remember, we don't really have any liturgies from the second century, but we have documents describing them. One of them was Justin Martyr's, uh, in Justin Martyr's apology, where he stressed the amen of the people. And even in the late Middle Ages, when things were at their lowest, if you will, in terms of people's participation, uh, the prayer was said inaudibly until the last bit of the Eucharistic prayer, the priest would raise his voice so that the people would know that their amen was coming, and then they would respond, amen. And in the 1979 Book of Common Prayer, the Amen is all caps to give the emphasis to that ascent. So yeah, I, <clears throat> it's not necessarily something you shout, but definitely Amen. All right, we're praying this together. Why do you not say that? Uh, because other priests that I know and admire always said that when the priest says the Amen, priest has said the prayer, and the amen, in any prayer, the amen is the people's assent to the prayer that the priest has just said. And so, in that sense, I won't say your responses in the Eucharist, and I won't say the amen. If I have prayed a prayer by myself, then I won't say the amen. When we all pray the Lord's Prayer together, I say the amen. It, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's the same principle that goes beyond amen. Uh, in Eucharistic prayer C, for example, every bit has a response that's in italics, and the priest would not say those parts. Now, there's something strange about Eucharistic prayer C in terms of human behavior that there is usually some confusion that I perceive and have perceived my whole life, and I've got to find it so that you know what I'm ta talking about. What? I said it's about page 370, I think, where the... 372 is D. No, C. C. Maybe 369 is Okay, so, yeah, 370. <clears throat> My experience of saying this prayer is that 
from the point of God of all power all the way through from the primal elements, people say the response on, on cue. But for whatever reason, when I get to again and again, you called us to return through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. There are crickets. And I've, in some places, had to start it in order to get people to say it. I, there's something about that break there that throws people off, and I don't know why. I, so we don't do it very often, so you might not even remember it when we, if we do. When do we do it? Lent. Lent, okay. We'll have to pay more attention. <clears throat> started this stuff. So following the, uh, the Amen, we move into the Lord's Prayer. Uh, since the 400s, the, that would be the early 5th century, the Lord's Prayer was included as a devotion of preparation prior to receiving communion, and it was said after the breaking of the bread. Uh, early church fathers identified the daily bread with the bread of Eucharist. The early church fathers being a group of theologians who lived from the, about the mid-fourth century into the latter fifth century. Gregory the, Gregory the Great placed it immediately after the great Amen, and it was later interpreted to function as a conclusion to the Eucharistic, <coughs> excuse me, the Eucharistic prayer. Uh, in different liturgies, uh, a form of introduction was used to express the church's confident and bold obedience to saying the prayer Jesus instructed his followers to pray. That's why we say, and now we boldly say, Our Father. It's in confident and bold obedience to, the, uh, to Jesus' instruction to pray in this way. In many rites, the prayer was said by all, except the Roman rite, where uh, it directed the priest alone to say everything up to the petition to deliver us from evil. So the priest would say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation. And then everyone would say, but deliver us from evil. End. No, for thine is the kingdom and the power. That, no. Not even an amen. Oh. I don't know that there wasn't. I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm, I'm 99. The 1552 Book of Common Prayer, so you got the 1549. 1552 is the second one. Directed the priest to say it with the people repeating each petition. And it wasn't until 1662 that Matthew's doxology, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, was included in the Eucharistic prayer. Now, you need to know something about that. Pretty much any Bible that you pick up, except for King James Version, when you are in Matthew's Gospel and you read Jesus teaching them to pray the Lord's Prayer, after you get to and deliver us from evil, you'll find an asterisk. And if you look at the footnote, it will tell you some later manuscripts include, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Now, the significance of that is that if you, you can think way, 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 way back to what I've taught about uh, the scriptures and, you know, what, what can we get at that's really kind of the accurate stuff that, that the writers actually wrote and what was laid it, ad, laid it, uh, added later? So if you got a bunch of manuscripts that don't say anything and then suddenly you have a manuscript that does, you've got to go, hmm, 
Why now? Where did this come from? So we've got all these manuscripts that don't have, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, and then suddenly you do. It was added. You know, there's some scribe somewhere going, Our Father. Oh, this is a terrible ending. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And next thing you know, it's in there, and in 1662, it gets added. But uh, I'm telling you, it's not part of the Lord's Prayer. No, it doesn't even sound like something Jesus himself would say. It sounds like we added it to... We did. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we added it. But you know, the thing is, is that once you do things twice, it's tradition. <laughs> It does. I know, and that's probably why it'll never go away. It, it, uh, it becomes really obvious at funerals when you've got Roman Catholics and Protestants in the same room. You can always spot the Protestants because they're going for the eyes of the kingdom and the power. Yeah, at funerals now. Yeah. They'll start it and then they'll, oh. Yeah. And he doesn't get it. But I was at one on Monday and then there was funny because I ended and I knew to stop. And then they said a few words and then said those three lines. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's part so of the new I was right. like, oh, that's new. Yeah. Because that's they never said that at all. Ever. And it was a huge, you know, service. So I was like, oh, this is interesting. Yeah. And I was glad because I like those lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The girls go to a scout club called American Heritage Girls, and it's um, hosted by a Catholic church. So I sit there and go, hmm, you try not to say it once. So, although now we're in three years, so I've gotten to the point where I clip it there and I say it all here. I've, I've been transitioning well now, but at the beginning it was hard. Mm -hmm. It was really hard. <laughs> yeah, and amen and amen. Oh yeah, I don't, I don't know. Is that, I think it's just, is that a Protestant Catholic thing or a North-South thing? Or? No, no, no. It, it's not just Protestant Catholic, although up here we might identify it as Protestant Catholic. But if you go into the South into a Baptist church or... Uh, it's amen. It's amen. <laughs> Long syllable on the first one. Uh, grammatically, it says a at the end of a syllable <clears throat> the time. I kind of feel like I'm like, just a different, like I'm, um, you know, like a different language. When I go into a Catholic church, <laughs> yeah. that's what it kind of feels like. It's it's the same right now, different language, even though the words all look the same on the printed page. So like I'll say, you know, the amen, amen, different, and then I'm like, jeez, oh, I just feel like I don't belong here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, all right, following the uh, Lord's Prayer comes what is called the fraction, the breaking of the bread. It had and has a practical function. It is to divide it for consumption. But everything that started with a practical function div uh, came to take on theological and symbolic meaning. Like candles, we have candles in order to See. have light. <laughs> Uh, but now they've taken on, you know, more meaning. And again, with the fraction, it had the practical purpose of being able to divide bread. And back, you know, way back when, it was real bread. And now, of course, it's the symbol of Christ's body broken. And various practices began to pop up in the Middle Ages that I, I find a, a little bit fascinating and confusing. Bread consecrated, for, for example, bread consecrated by a bishop was broken, and then those pieces were sent to outlying parishes that they would then put in the chalice of wine at a Eucharist as a sign of church unity. It makes sense when you think about it. Right? The bishop is a symbol of unity, of church unity. So the bishop consecrates bread, breaks it, it's sent out to all the parishes, and then at, a, at some Eucharist, a piece of that, <clears throat> that piece of bread is put into the wine, that the commingling of the bread and wine, bringing them together, making them one symbol of unity. In other places, a piece of bread was placed in the cup 
or a piece of bread that had been, excuse me, let me back up. In some places, a piece of bread would be put into what we call now reserve sacrament, okay? And then at another Eucharist, the reserve sacrament would come out and a piece of that reserved bread would go into the freshly consecrated wine as a symbol of unity in time. Okay? The past is brought into the present in the cup. The past and the present uh, are one. And remember the anamnesis. And the point of the anamnesis is not just remembering, but bringing the events of the past into the present as a reality. That would have been a pretty powerful symbol uh, in the Middle Ages to take a piece of bread and put it in the cup uh, like that. Eventually those practices disappeared, but uh, in some places a portion of a wafer was placed in the cup right then and there. I mean, I've seen clergy do that, where at a Eucharist they break the bread and then they take us, they, then they off to the side will take another piece and drop it into the wine right then. Uh, now that obviously comes from the previous two practices. It's, all, it's evolved to a point where it, now what is the symbolism? Well, one thing that I've read is that it's a symbol of the resurrection. And here's the connection. In death, body and blood are separated. But if I take a piece of the bread and put it into the wine, they are brought together, which is life. They are united. I think that's a bit too complicated. Um, and I, I, I do not think co-mixture is something that we should be doing anymore. But, and I, I think many clergy don't. Maybe, maybe high church clergy still do. Yeah, there's some high, high church clergy that do. Cranmer's book of 1549 did not retain the co-mixture. However, uh, there was apparently some rubric, I don't remember where it was, but a, Marion Hatchett, who wrote a commentary on the Book of Common Prayer, says that there was a direction that wafers were to be larger and thicker, and every wafer was broken into at least two pieces, every single one. So what that meant was, I don't know if you've ever seen that, so the priest has got these wafers. So before he would say the body and blood of Christ, he would take the one wafer and go... <laughs> The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. And each wafer would be broken. And that's the behind that. Well, it's the same as the fraction. It's all part of the, 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 the Christ body is broken for you. Yep. So we're saying that symbolically by actually doing it. The 1662 prayer book, <clears throat> so that's, let's see, 1549, 1552, 1559, 1662, included a rubric instructing the bread to be broken at the words, he break it. So those are the words of institution. So on the night before he suffered, the Lord Jesus Christ took bread, break it, he broke it, and that's when the fraction would occur. And it was kept that way, even up to the American revision, the first American prayer book in 1789, the, 17, the 1979 prayer book restores the fraction as a dramatic moment in the Eucharist in preceding the communion, immediately before communion. And, you know, followed by the fraction sentence. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, Therefore let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Or... <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you need a coffee? Do I need a coffee? I need water is what I need. But <clears throat> What was I saying? Um, I know I've, this, I've had allergies bad this whole, uh, like, whole month. Actually, now that you see that, I haven't been allergies. Uh, oh, all right, so the anthem, the fraction anthem. <clears throat> when, the act, when the fraction anthem is sung, at least here at Christ Church, uh, I try not to say both the sentence and the anthem, particularly when the anthem is 
says the words. So up until Advent, I was chanting, I was singing the Fraction Anthem. Now what we're doing is saying the Fraction sentence followed by a, it's more of a, an anthem like uh, the Agnus Dei. I don't know if we're, I can't remember now if it's the Agnus Dei in particular, but you know what I mean by Agnus Dei? Lord have mercy. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Yeah, well, no, what's the, uh, what's the right one? Uh, uh, I'm forgetting it now. There's a... Yeah, there's a Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. What is the what is the uh, Agnus Day in right one? Do you remember? O Lamb of God, that o Lamb of God that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God that takest away the sins of the world. Okay, that's that's an example of, of a okay. an anthem at the fraction. And then there's the invitation to communion. The gifts of God for the people of God. And the rubric says, and may be added, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts <clears throat> by faith with thanksgiving. In the Eastern liturgies of the fourth century, it was called the, the Sancta Sanctus, the holy for the holy. The holy bread and wine for the holy people of God or holy things for holy people. Okay, makes sense? So, the thing though to remember about the invitation to communion, there's just a bit of history here. So, you're a Roman Catholic and you believe that the bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus Christ, literally. If that's so, then the way to invite people, it would make sense to say the gifts of God for the people of God. Period. Stop. Nothing more to say. But if you are a member, if you are a part of the Reformation, a Protestant, and you believe that the Eucharist is a memorial that it isn't literally the bread and wine, but what makes Jesus Christ present to us is this whole act of remembering God, then you would add, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. One of the things that divided the reformers from the Roman Catholic Church was uh, the reformers believed that our mental participation was required in order for the Eucharist to be efficacious. That's a fancy word for effective. It's effective when we think about it as being effective. In the Roman Catholic tradition, when it's, it is the body and blood of Christ, what you think about it doesn't matter because it is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Period, end of story. Cramner, in his wisdom, put them both in there. All right, we're gonna kill, you know, that one bird with these two stones. So how come the Catholic Church doesn't, how come they just do bread? And they don't do one? Some do both. Yes. Yeah. Some do both, but not really. <clears throat> I don't know. I've never, uh, I've never known that. I, uh, I don't know. I'll have to look that up. Uh, the <clears throat> so then we get to the actual giving of the bread and wine. So people come to the altar, and the bread is distributed with words. The wine is distributed with words. 
going all the way back to the apostolic tradition of Apollotus, the bread was given with the words, the bread of heaven in Christ Jesus. And the response was amen. And then the wine would come and you drank the wine three times. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> need a bigger chalice so the first would be uh, the words would be in the name of God uh, in God the Father Almighty the person says amen drink from the wine and in the Lord Jesus Christ amen drink from the wine and in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church amen drink from the wine you go home feeling good <laughs> In the Roman church, in the Roman West, in the Middle Ages, the uh, body, uh, the bread and wine were distributed with the words, the body or blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you in eternal life. In Cramner's, what's called the Order of Communion in 1548, this is the precursor to the 1559 Book of Common Prayer, he included the words, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, preserve thy body unto everlasting life. And then, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for thee, preserve thy soul unto everlasting life. The distinction between the physical body and the body of Christ in the bread and the blood with the soul was a distinction made by some medieval theologians, most notably Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologica. When the 1549 Book of Common Prayer was published, Cramner maintained that distinction in the prayer of what's called humble access, not in the words of administration. The prayer of humble access differs what it, from what's found now in Rite 1, Prayer 1, which is as close as you get. If you read Rite 1, Prayer 1, you're getting pretty close to Cramner's 1549 Book of Common Prayer, but not exactly. And one of the differences is found in these words in the prayer of humble access, where this sentence is in there, grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear son, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be cleaned by his body, and our souls washed by his precious blood. That phrase is no longer in the prayer of humble access, in the 79 Book of Common Prayer. The phrase, though, is kept uh, in both the bread and wine at the administration of the sacrament. In, in other words, the administration. So the 1552 book, let me back up. Let me go, let me go to the prayer book and see what, uh, now I'm going to forget. I never do the long version of the Eucharistic prayer, and so I don't really remember it too well. Uh, Prayer one. Okay, here we go. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat in remembrance that Christ died for thee, and feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for thee, preserve thy body and soul. So what we did is put soul into both, rather than divide between the body, the bread, and the blood. You're following me? Yeah. Okay. And it was in the 1552 revision that these additional words were added, take and eat in remembrance that Christ died for thee, and feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving. Those sentences were used by continental reformers 
who were more along the lines of, if you know anything about Reformation theology, Zwingli and others who believed that the Eucharist was a memorial and not, a, and not the sacrament per se. And because in England, both schools of thought were in the same church, both of them <clears throat> were put in. And you have to remember, though, that you know, during this time, people were dying and people were killing each other over these differences between Catholic and Protestant theology. I mean, blood was being shed. People were dying over it. And so it just became increasingly important for somehow the prayer book to try to incorporate these to keep people from killing each other. Uh, let's see, the 1662 Book of Common Prayer and every American uh, Book of Common Prayer kept these words. Uh, of, of administration, and the 1979 uh, also keeps them. I would think if you were giving communion to someone who was dying, using that language of preserving thy soul, <clears throat> yeah, oh, I think so. And the conclusion of the Eucharistic prayer, the, although the Eucharist. I think I've already discussed how elaborate uh, rites were developed for the conclusion of the Eucharist. The 1559 Book of Common Prayer concluded with a sentence of scripture, a fixed prayer, and a blessing. The 1552 expanded it to include the Lord's Prayer and the Gloria in Excelsis. Moving ahead to the 1892 Book of Common, American Book of Common Prayer, uh, it permitted the singing of a hymn after the blessing. That's pretty late when you think about it. They weren't singing hymns. Now, Marion Hatchett, <clears throat> who's the guy who wrote the commentary on the Book of Common Prayer, he has he every once in a while puts in these editorial comments. He believes that the exit right, as we now have it or, or that we inherited uh, from 1928 had gotten bloated with extraneous things that distract from its purpose. Uh, in particular, he goes on at some length about what are called ablutions, washing. So everyone's received communion. We we're all done, and now we've got to deal with the dishes. <laughs> Someone's got to clean the dishes. So how does that work? When is that going to take place? Marion Hatchett says that it should take place in the sacristy after the service is over. In the past, clergy were the one who did that. But I disagree with Hatchet because now it's the expectation that clergy greet people following the service. So the dishes are just going to sit there. And then I got to go teach a class. The dishes are going to sit there even longer. So we got to deal with the dishes. So let's deal with them in the service. Now, they, the, the, the ablutions, I agree with him, they really don't have a liturgical function. They don't. Ideally, what would happen is anything that's left over would be thrown on the ground or the wine poured into what's called a piscina. It's a drain, a sink with a drain going into the ground. Or lay people would deal with the dishes by consuming the elements after the service. So if, if I could do it, I would just not do the ablutions at the service. But there's still the problem of risking spilling a chalice that has a half a, it's a half a glass of wine left in it. And instead of drinking it, it's left there and someone tips it over. And next thing you know, there's wine everywhere. So I think there's a practical reason to do it uh, in church. Well, it's 10 o'clock. I don't have a whole lot more to do. Uh, what we're going to do next week is I'm going to finish up. I'm going to talk about the vestments that we wear 
and explain some of the history and meaning of our vestments. And then that'll probably wind us up, and then we'll have one more, one more Sunday <clears throat> before Christmas, and we'll do uh, Stump the Rector, where you just ask me anything you want, and I'll, if I know the answer, I'll tell you, and if not, I'll say, I don't know. <laughs> 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 <laughs>